Hello and welcome to the Occupied Thoughts podcast. I'm Peter Beinart, a non-resident fellow with the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Today I'm joined by Suleiman Khatib and Panina Eilberg Schwartz, authors of a brand new book, In This Place Together. Suleiman, or Suli, is a Palestinian from Hizme, a village next to Jerusalem. He became active against the Israeli occupation and was imprisoned by Israel at age 14 for 10 years. Suli has been on a journey of spiritual and political transformation, which led him to co-found the group Combatants for Peace, together with other former Palestinian combatants and former Israeli Jewish soldiers. Panina is an American Jewish writer and activist. She and Suli worked together to write this book, which the publisher says is, quote, a narrative meditation on joint nonviolence, opening a window to the questions of power, multiple narratives, and imagination that touch on struggles for justice everywhere. I'm excited to be joined by Panina and Suli today to discuss these topics, Palestinian rights, Israeli oppression, the possibilities and challenges of shared struggle, which are particularly relevant today. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Uh, uh, Suli, I wanted to start with you. Just tell me a little bit about how this book came to be. Uh, thank you, Peter, for uh, uh, this uh, interview. And uh, uh, for the book, I, I you know, I, I've been active most of my life. So usually in the framework of combatants for peace and sometimes personally, uh, we do share our personal stories. Uh, with different audience and our uh, you know background and the uh, transformation and how uh, uh, how we became together like uh, in our group uh, so a few people has told me that uh, I should write my story so I'm not a writer mm -hmm. uh, so I uh, thought uh, yeah I knew Nina from before and I knew Nina's mom actually and uh, so I suggested her in San Francisco, we met in San Francisco, and I suggested her that to work together on this book. Yeah, mm. uh, six um, years ago, almost six years ago. So maybe, Sully, you could talk a little bit about your personal story, since it, it, it is the, the core of this book. Um, your, your experiences when you were growing up and, and how it led you to the work that you're doing now. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, my background basically in a three quick short parts is at the time before jail, like my childhood, I grew up, uh, as you said, in a village northeast Jerusalem called Hizma. So I born in Jerusalem actually. Uh, and as a, a young uh, Palestinian boy I, in the school, my school politics was not allowed actually. So I uh, participated in raising Palestinian flags and writing uh, slogans of free Palestine on the wall. Um, I was very active compared to my uh, generation, I would say. My older brother was also in jail, so I interacted with the prisoners community and ex-prisoners. Um, at the age of 14, I um, led uh, a small group of kids to uh, struggle against the occupation using uh, cocktail Molotov and uh, in order to have the weapons, uh, we stabbed two Israelis, and uh, this ended up with a slightly wounded for the two Israelis. Uh, so at age of 14 and five months, I ended up in the Israeli jail. I was uh, the youngest prisoner, a uh, political prisoner at the time. And what year uh, was this? What year was this? This was 1986. 1986, okay. Yeah, I born in 1972, so just... Okay. Uh, yeah, I, during the jail time, I was part of the uh, Fatah movement uh, led by Arafat, and I was very active also in jail, uh, participating in different actions that the prisoners took, like the food hunger strike, mainly like for 17 days, 16 days, or 10 days. Uh, and that was uh, part of my uh, change and seeing the power of nonviolence through hunger strikes and uh, different strategies that we use in jail to improve the daily life in jail. Usually we succeed to achieve most of our demands in, in the hunger strikes. Uh, so my teenager time, I, I spent it in jail. I spent 10 years and five months. Uh, um, I was sentenced to 15 years, uh, actually. Yeah, so in jail also, I worked in the library as um, people can read a lot about the details in the book, but in a short, I... Uh, uh, Worked in the library. I also studied about uh, the civil rights movements in America, Martin Luther King, about Nelson Mandela, 
that he was in jail himself and the other nonviolence uh, leaders. And also, I would say, this is uh, connecting to uh, Palestinian uh, nonviolence historical practice that called sumud means steadfastness. So we have this in our culture, actually, just to say. Uh, and among uh, many other like actions that we did in jail, I uh, uh, became more open. I studied also English and Hebrew in jail. So just to say jail is not a university. We used to call it a revolutionary university. Uh, for some people, this was opportunity to practice uh, uh, non-balance and education, alternative education, uh, to create leaders in, in different organizations in jail. Uh, of course, like there was a time also for, with a lot of violence in jail and psychological torture and physical torture when I was uh, 14 and a half, a half, especially in the uh, investigation time. And sometimes like um, also a lot of tear gas in the rooms and the cells and inside jail and many other um, a humiliation of the prisoners' rights. Like it's hundreds of tools that are used against the prisoners also as a, a humiliation and torture. Uh, no, for me, like, uh, and some maybe other prisoners, I would say this is an important part of my personal story and a story of many thousands of Palestinians, unfortunately, that were in jail and the thousands that still in jail, including women and kids, because uh, for Israelis, they don't recognize the prisoners as war prisoners or Geneva Accord for the prisoners' rights. So we have always to struggle to improve the daily life in jail. Uh, in jail, like some people maybe, I also reached the conclusion practically uh, that there is no uh, military solution for our conflict. And this is actually used later on after jail in combatants for peace and some other groups that people that fought in their hands reach the same conclusion. Uh, but for me, this is not just like a strategy to use nonviolence to end the occupation rather than a philosophy. I believe nonviolence choice is much harder than violence from a real experience. Uh, yeah, so I, <clears throat> I after, like through the jail time, I has gone through a long, long journey that Change is not easy, obviously, like in the different levels spiritually, not just intellect, it's not just intellectual question, you know, especially when you are inside the jail. Uh, but uh, after jail time, I devoted myself to um, the core of my struggle in a first place for our cause that I believe uh, um, there is no other way of liberation for our people uh, separately from each other. I meant to say Palestinians and Israeli Jews. And the idea of either us or them, for me, it's just idea from the past. I'm no longer there. And I searched for uh, in the second Tifada after my uh, release, I searched also for uh, uh, Palestinians and Israeli partners. And that's how we came to create uh, Combatants for Peace. Uh, the founders were Israeli, ex-Israeli officers and ex-Palestinian prisoners that reached the same conclusion from different places. Of course, I'm aware of the power dynamic and uh, uh, differences in both sides, let's say. Uh, but some, a few people have to find like a common ground and create a new story, let's say, uh, by sharing our personal stories and coming together and uh, that's how we created Combatants for Peace uh, almost 15 years ago. I Maybe for the people who don't know, there is a really interesting documentary about Combatants for Peace called Disturbing the Beast. And that describes the work of this organization. Oh, that's great. Um, so Penina, uh, how about you? H how did you come to, as an, as an American Jew, how did you come to um, uh, being part of, of Tel Suli's story? Yeah, um, well, I grew up in uh, California, daughter of two very different rabbis, which I can share more about later if you want, but um, I grew up very rooted in the community and, um, and then like many other young American Jews sort of went through a process of um, becoming quite angry about what hadn't 
been shared with me about the reality of um, life under occupation for Palestinians. Um, so went through my own process around that again, which I could share more about if you want, but um, all that to say, I was sort of deep in the work of trying to find my place in the movement for Palestinian freedom when I met Suli, um, and that was at the house of my mother, um, like he said, um, and she had met him and been really moved by his story and um, asked him to come speak in Minnesota where she lived at the time. Um, and I, uh, yeah, so I happened to be at my mom's house when Suli was there and we hit it off and also like immediately got into an argument, which is uh, in the book where, um, my mom asked him to sleep in uh, a room where there was an Israeli flag. And I was very angry that she was asking him to do that. And he was telling me to calm down. Um, and I think our friendship started on those lines of sort of us in this interesting conversation of me sort of being angry and Suli telling me to calm down and uh, more complex uh, iterations of that political uh, disagreement. Um, and yeah, so we were friends for some time. And um, I think after, that first meeting, so we actually introduced me to my first job um, on Israel Palestine stuff, which was at a small organization called the Rebuilding Alliance. Um, I had worked at the New Israel Fund, was just sort of trying to find my place in the work. Um, and then uh, when Suli asked me to work on this, I actually, Suli, I think you asked me on Facebook a number of times before San Francisco, and I said no a number of times because I didn't quite understand what my position in relation to this work would be and, and why that would make sense. Um, but there was something about the moment in San Francisco when Suli came and asked me uh, again in person to work on the book that made me sort of see a pathway for this and why it would make sense for me to be a part of it. Um, and I think there were two pieces of that. One, I had really seen um, over the years the way that um, Suli's story and his way of uh, using language and uh, on all levels um, is, has been and continues to be really powerful tool for um, sort of piercing through the barrier that can um, be present, especially for American Jews, who I think are um, tend to be on guard when listening to Palestinian stories. And I thought that there was something really powerful about that there could be something really powerful about amplifying that story through a book. Um, and then I also, you know, through talking with Suli that day in San Francisco and understanding what his interest in my um, sort of presence in the book would be, uh, I also became interested in um, this idea of using the book, I wasn't quite sure in what way yet, to um, as an example of joint work. So like really investigating what does it mean to to make this book about joint work in a joint situation where Suli and I are coming from positions of really um, large power differential. Me as a white uh, American Jew, uh, Suli as a Palestinian living under occupation. There are other axes of power at play as well, like gender, um, and sort of trying to figure out like, how can we, you know, in addition to the main goal of the book, which is to share Suli's story and his vision and the stories of many other people who shaped him, to how to use the book to, with a secondary purpose as well, um, as a way to uh, explore what it means to work um, across difference um, and what that says about the outside world, um, this, the systems of power we're living under, um, and how we might use those lessons uh, in our struggles for justice. So, yeah. Um, that's great. Um, so I wanted to pick up on that point. Um, uh, you know, there is a Palestinian campaign, um, an anti-normalization campaign um, about uh, against working with Israelis in contexts which would not be directly in in support of ending uh, uh, Palestinian oppression. And and um, you yourself, right? You you talk in the book about you know ac you know concerns that you might have had about accusations made against you because of your work with Israelis um, that maybe you're even a spy. So I wanted just to ask you how you how you think about this this subject given given the power dynamics and given the debate that exists uh, among Palestinians on this question. Uh, yeah, thank you, Peter. This is uh, like a, a question that we live with for years and. Uh, so let me say this, that in the context of the anti-normalization thing, I am aware this is um, uh, the ideas that we are talking about are not a mainstream 
ideas, neither in the Palestinian side, neither in the Israeli side. So obviously with all the pain and the history and the, dra the, the trauma and the suffering and living under the occupation, of course, people are, um, many people are not ready to, let's say, work with the other side. Uh, and we know this from South Africa experience, from Ireland, from other places. And even the word normalization exists in South African language, uh, the local language, I forget the word, because in Arabic we call it Tatbiya, uh, and in North Ireland, in Ireland in both sides. So I am really uh, aware since I started reaching out to the other side uh, that there will be a price for that socially. Uh, and some friends even will be different than you, of course. And some people will call you are not Palestinian anymore. Um, so I, in the same time, I, like my, uh, let's say my Israeli friends that we uh, did together the Memorial Day last night, we'll talk about it later. Also, they has been called as cheating. They are not Israelis anymore and they are love with the Arab and so on. So uh, I, I don't really know any like a solution for this question. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking there, there is no one strategy to uh, change the system and end the occupation. So I believe the strategies that I believe in them, which is uh, under the line of uh, joint struggle and nonviolence are totally legitimate and moral strategies. And it's open for criticism, obviously, uh, as long as it's not like a life threat or something. Um, I live in Ramallah and I don't hide my public uh, uh, activism with Israelis, like my, in my social media, for example, and in my real life, to be honest. Uh, and as we speak always, like you lose some people and you gain a new community and a new friends and new alliances that are not based on your let's say, ethnic group. Uh, and I, I never, uh, like, sometimes I got criticism, of course, like personally or our organization, of course, like even yesterday, I looked at the memorial, the, uh, the joint memorial uh, event in Arabic because we had a page in Arabic. So some people are supportive and some people are like, for them, this is beyond any imagination. And there's a lot of criticism and I think this is fine for me. I, uh, as long as the conversation is respectful and it doesn't take my Palestinian, you know, identity away, I am totally fine. And sometimes I have to say, Peter, the criticism is not coming specifically from Palestinian, which is legitimate criticism. I have to say sometimes it's coming from more privileged white American person. And that's more like annoying to me than if it come from a uh, Palestinian to be honest. Yeah. Penina, I wanted to ask you about the kind of the theory of change, you know, um, I, this is something I think about a lot myself, you know, I'm also an American Jew and, and I, I have seen that people be, at least for the moment and in for a moment, opened up or, or maybe destabilized in, uh, um, by seeing a reality or hearing a story, encountering Palestinian humanity, encountering the utter brutality of what Israel does. But um, I also sometimes wonder, well, what happens? Is that, is that enough? Or does that just, do people just close back down? Or, or sometimes they just think they know, but then they, they you know, get back to their, their normal lives and, and they think, well, you know, um, the costs might be, might be pretty high for me. So let me just, so I guess my question to you is, what, how much change do you think in, in, in the Jewish community is possible through this kind of storytelling and truth telling, um, and how much is how much kind of is required of a kind of a, how much requires pressure? How um, and, and how do the two work together? Yeah, I mean, nonviolent pressure, obviously. Good. Totally. Um, yeah, I don't think it's enough, mm -hmm. like at all. No mm -hmm. question. Um, and I think actually, when I entered the book, mm -hmm. I think I was more suspicious of the sort of heart opening storytelling thing than I am now. Um, I think that it's one tool among many. So I do believe that um, we need work like this that allows people to open their hearts a little bit in, in an area where they're 
their trauma doesn't get activated and they can start to like change slowly. Um, and that also needs to happen multiple times, you know, across the course of somebody's process in order to actually move them towards action. Um, and I think we also need the pressure, as you said, I mean, we need direct action. We need people to be challenged directly. And I believe actually, like you said at the end of the, your question, that those strategies really support each other. Um, and so we need, you know, we need JVP and we need, uh, uh, International Jewish Anti-Zionist Network, and we need J Street, and we need Combatants for Peace, and we need storytelling. Um, we need all these things, I think, um, so that people have different entry points um, and different experiences that sort of move them um, along in their process. And of course, you know, our, our end goal is not to move people along in their process towards supporting liberation. Our, our end goal is liberation, but, you know, the reality is that changing people's hearts and minds is uh, an important strategy in social justice movements and has always been so. Um, and I think, yeah, I just wanted to add something I think about a lot. Um, I'm gonna forget the person's name, um, who is a former uh, white supremacist, um, who's now doing anti-racist education. And I remember hearing uh, him on the radio somewhere and he uh, was in school in Florida and I think he sort of got outed as a racist and, you know, people were yelling at him and calling him names and, you know, kicking him out of the community. And there was a, a actually a Jewish, an Orthodox Jewish person who invited him uh, to his house for Shabbat and they started having Shabbat dinners. He, he was a white supremacist and also anti-Semitic. Um, and anyway, that was part of his process of transformation. And on the radio show, the person, the interviewer asked him like, oh, isn't this an incredible, example of what dialogue can do. And he said, yes. And also, I don't think that that gesture of this person opening their home to me would have been, would have meant the same thing without the context of the pressure of the people calling me names. And that's what I believe. I think, I think we need both and that, and that those things really, really support each other in the end um, to both move individuals along in their process and also move us communally towards where we need to be to fight for for liberation for Palestinians and and all people. So I wanted to ask you, you know, you speak to a lot of American Jews, you you know, you work with a lot of Israelis, you make yourself very vulnerable by talking about these brutal experiences that you've had. Um, and I imagine that, you know, sometimes you probably get, you know, people who respond in a variety of different ways. But I wonder when you think about what you want to come out of these encounters? Um, I, I, I'm wondering if there have been if there have been moments when you've been disappointed by what people how people have behaved after you told them your story, um, either Israelis or diaspora Jews, and if there are other particular moments when you've been really gratified, you know, by things that you've seen that people have done after 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 experiencing what you've gone through. Um. Honestly, my, my real experience with uh, encounters and talking to uh, like specifically Israelis or American Jews in general, um, I have to say, firstly, not everybody is willing to listen to people like my, myself. So there is that also. So I'm aware that we meet certain type of people usually. Yes, yes. Um, that's important to say. Um, and second, I want to say like, in my experience, like ch change, there is no one way to change people's heart or soften their hearts. There is, and it can take time. Uh, sometimes it's in one meeting. It happened with me, like, uh, let's say with Encounter, where I meet a group of uh, American Jews usually, and twice they brought Israelis to Ramallah, which is important to break also the fear and the uh, psychological barriers uh, to meet in a nice place in Ramallah. Uh, I mean, uh, um, like usually I, I think because we are talking about personal stories, I feel more openness in the eyes of, of the people that I meet. I encounter a lot of people uh, from these meetings, not just with me, with other Palestinian voices also that really change their life. And they, like many of them still writing us and some of them are uh, uh, one of the uh, most like active activist in combatants for peace 
uh, we met actually not even in a lecture or a talk in accidentally in a Ethiopian restaurant in Jerusalem. Um, and somehow we start conversation and I give her the uh, website of Combatant Service and she's now leading the educational program in Combatant Service. And she's also going to the field in Jordan Valley to uh, support Palestinian Shepherd every day. Uh, for example, so when I see people like this, this gives me a lot of hope. And of course, like it's not always easy and it's not smooth. And you, as you said, like you to go back to the personal trauma and jail and torture and um, details like that, it's uh, it's challenging. I but I think that a personal story and storytelling is uh, one of the uh, best tools to really reach out to people and to humanize our stories all. Um, and sometimes, yeah, I encounter people that are really hard. Especially when I used to go around with uh, disturbing the beast with the movie, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I met some people like uh, one Israeli man that he couldn't sit in the movie uh, watching, and he told me that he killed people in his hand, and he left the house where we uh, screened the movie, and then we supposed to talk me and one of the uh, my friends from Combatants for Beast, my cats. Yeah, there's like heavy moments happening sometimes. Also, we bought the movie in Ramallah and a few people left uh, before they, at the beginning of the movie because they they couldn't sit on the table. They thought this is a Zionist narrative here. Uh, so there is like moments like this. Uh, even I, uh, I can tell you, I we also screened the movie in the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles. I was surprised, like one woman like was shouting there and said, there is no Palestinian people. This, these people doesn't exist. So I was there with the uh, producer of the movie, Steve Abkin and uh, Marcina Hill and Jamil and uh, other uh, Asaf, I believe a few of us there. Yeah, we were really calm and uh, yeah. So I just have to use sarcasm. I told her, yes, we didn't exist. Ever we, me and Jamil just came from the sky right now. <laughs> we never exist. So of course we encounter a lot of reactions. Yeah. And, but I learned, like I also studied some nonviolence communication where it helps us to communicate with people where they are at, not where we want them to be. And this is like important uh, to be aware of that. Right, right. Panini, you, you write at the beginning of the book about your apprehensions about the, the power dynamics. And I wonder, um, um, and these are power dynamics that don't only exist between Jews and Palestinians, they exist in, in, in many other different contexts and, and I think can pose real challenges for people who um, enjoy certain rights and privileges and, and, and uh, want to engage with changing that, but also want to do so without kind of replicating those those same structures of, of power and privilege. And I'm just wondering what you learned through your experience with Suli in writing this book that, that might help others in thinking about that. Yeah, I mean, I <laughs> my first response is that I don't have any, uh, any good answers to that question except to, to really be interested always in paying attention um, and being really curious about what comes up. Um, and doing a lot of work to, to learn about these things. I think, you know, my background also, I remember when I was starting in like working on Palestine, Israel stuff, I was reading a lot of um, Wahat al-Salam Neve Shalom's pedagogy on dialogue, which is very much about, you know, what are the power dynamics that are showing up in a dialogue space and how do you reflect that to the participants? And then how do you reflect that in such a way that they're moved to go back out in the world and a, be aware of their relation to systems of power and then B, shake it up and try to find ways to slip the trap of those systems. Um, so I think there's a, there's a lot of really wonderful res resources on it. I've also learned a lot from being a part of Surge, um, which is you know domestic um, US racial justice organization, primarily white people um, struggling in solidarity um, with black indigenous and other people of color led movements. Um, so I'd say, you know, read about this, like read, um, it, you know, if you're white, if you're Jewish, like read about people who have been in this struggle for a long time and how, what they have learned and how they approach it. Um, 
pay attention, like know that no matter what, like these things are going to come up. We are all products of the systems that um, that are outside, whether it's racism or anti-Semitism or patriarchy, colonialism, all of these things, and they all show up in our in our relationships, and we should expect that they will. Um, and and we should be curious about it, um, and and just try to then be responsive to whatever comes up. Um, I'm not sure that I have any. I think I say in the book at one point that I don't have a map for it, and that feels very true. Um, I don't have a clean answer to that question. I wish that I did. Um, but I'm, and maybe this is just obvious, but certainly I was always thinking about um, how much space I took up in, certainly in the book and, and in conversations and interviews, um, the ways that I was sort of drawing Suli out, how that, um, what that might have been connected to. I was aware, I was certainly aware when we were talking about really difficult things about um, Suli's history with having been tortured and interrogated and like, what does this mean for me to be like drawing information out of him? Things like that I was um, thinking about and I would encourage people to um, be present with that. Um, trying to think if there's anything else. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that the other thing, this, it, this is sort of a, a tangent to your question, but um, something that I did think was important in the book is that, um, you know, I made a decision and, and with Suli that like, I wouldn't be an invisible writer. Um, and I think that traditionally often that is the person in power's way of trying to reckon with their power to not be visible. Um, this is a really fraught and important conversation and I'm not convinced that I have the right answer on this, but my feeling when I started writing and my feeling now still is that um, it's important to not pretend to be invisible because we're not, because our power when we're coming from the privileged position is at play and we need to be able to reckon with that and we can't do that if we're pretending that it's not there. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Great. Um, um, so I wanna end by asking you to talk a little bit about um, the joint memorial uh, uh, ceremony that was held um, uh, uh, just this week. And um, uh, this is something which is, I think been growing over the years and, and to talk about the, what the significance of, of that. Uh... Yes, so uh, the, the Joint Memorial Day, we used to call it uh, the uh, Alternative Memorial Day. Since a few years, we call it the Palestinian-Israeli Joint Memorial Day uh, because we want to create a new reality. And this is part of the theory of change that uh, we're trying uh, uh, here. Uh, so the idea came like really 15, 16 years ago, and we held like... Uh, a small ceremony of 70 people maybe attending and nobody knew about it anyway at the time. The second year we have 200 people, the, th the third year we had like 500, 1000. And the year before Corona, we actually had the biggest ceremony uh, physically in a park in Tel Aviv, we had uh, 9,000 to 10,000 people mm -hmm. uh, with a small demonstration of extreme right wingers against us that they used violence actually against the participants. So in, uh, since last year, because of Corona, uh, we used the Zoom and uh, online. So we had 200,000 people watch last year. So it became a really kind of global event, which I really believe this is a universal uh, value. It's not fitting just for Israelis and Palestinians, rather to the world. Uh, and this year, as far as I know, I don't have the exact number, but we had a meeting last night after the ceremony on Zoom for all our team. And the, the numbers I heard, they crossed the numbers of last year, like 280,000 something. So I don't have the exact number. But uh, so we had uh, last night one station in Tel Aviv and one in uh, Beit Jala uh, with different arrangements due to the corona because we don't have vaccination yet. I myself got Corona last week, so I couldn't join personally, so I was doing a Zoom afterwards uh, from home. Uh, I think this is like a proof of many things, like one, that small group of people really can uh, participate in this change making. Uh, and definitely we, we, we appreciate that we had like 120 organizations 
uh, sponsoring the Memo joint memorial day and that's why it became visible for many people around the world so it's not right just like combatants for peace and our partners in the family forum uh, i believe like that one of the most important tools here is really to work with different groups actually uh, and we'll have the nakba ceremony next month organized by combatants for peace and other partners i hope to that they will join that and this is a, a taboo conversation for the Israelis. The Nakba does not exist in the education system or in the normal system. So this is part of like uh, the daily work we do here. It's uh, as Nina mentioned, I, I, I also believe uh, there is no one strategy in one way. There is direct action happening on the ground. Uh, there is a call for demonstration Saturday in Sheikh Jarrah against the evacuation of our Palestinian families in East Jerusalem. There is a bunch of events happening through the year, thousands of lectures with all kinds of audience. So we're trying our best, actually, and uh, that gives me a lot of hope. The a new story that we're trying to create and to let it born here is really happened step by step by people uh, that trying uh, a new thinking uh, in uh, support of this new uh, narrative and as they say and this is maybe i finished here like uh, the reality is hard and complex and there is a lot of hopelessness but stories like the memorial day the joint memorial day uh, the nakba ceremony the activism that happen every day on the ground that's what give us hope and that's what keep us uh, going actually Thank you. The, um, the, the book is, um, is called In This Place Together. Um, thank you so much, uh, Panina and Suli, for our conversation today. And thank you to our listeners for tuning into this episode of the Occupied Thoughts podcast, a project of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. You can visit our website at fmvp.org to subscribe to our many resources and to find today's podcast episode posted along with links to additional resources about this topic. You can also subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Spotify. I'm Peter Beinart. I look forward to our next episode. Thank you so much again, Suli. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for having us. Thanks.